Hello, everybody. This is Grandmaster Robert Fungaski for ChessLecture.com. And today I wanted to share a couple of games with you that I recently came across in a lecture that Grandmaster Oscar Pano gave. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with Oscar Pano, he's a Grandmaster from Argentina. And he's, about, I think, 85 years old now. And he was world junior champion in 1953, and I think among the top 20 or 30 players in the world in the 1950s or so. So he's really one of these legends of the golden days of chess. And you know he has uh, fantastic games against Fischer, Korchnoi, Spassky. He's got wins against all these guys. And for many years, he has been sort of the patriarch, along with Nidorf, of Argentinian chess, and of course, he's pretty much the only one left from that generation. And every Saturday, he gives uh, lectures in a very important club in Argentina. And since the whole COVID-19 quarantine era started, he's been transitioning to the online format. So this is how I came across his lectures. And what I'm going to show you is a selection of games from that lecture that I think are, are very interesting. The name of his lecture was a very, it caught my attention, a very funny name. He said, the good thing about the bad bishop. And I'd never heard this theme framed that way. And uh, this is going to be the subject that we're going to be discussing, right? the good bishop against the bad bishop. But normally when we discuss this, we kind of emphasize why the bishop is good. Here, we're going to emphasize why the bad bishop is actually not so bad. So this is taken from a very famous game. This is game 24 from the World Championship match played between Karpov and Kasparov in 1984. And Kasparov had just played the move knight to d7. And a very interesting strategic battle ensues in this endgame where white played the move pawn to c6 here. Now, of course, the idea is since you really can't do anything to defend that pawn, you might as well sacrifice it or give it back on your own terms to try to put a little bit of damage in your opponent's position, right? So now after B takes C6, we're gonna get a symmetric pawn structure on the queen side. So the game continued rook A, B1, and after knight B6, bishop drops back to E2 and pawn to C5. So at this point, it might seem that even though white managed to damage black's pawn structure on the queen side that black still got a pretty good deal because black is going to have his a7 and c5 pawns on dark squares whereas white should he advance the pawn to c4 will have his pawns on light squares and that's going to interfere with his own bishop so moreover this knight on b6 is going to do a good job at neutralizing the b file so my first impression when i saw his position black is doing absolutely fine but here Karpov played a brilliant move. And I should say it's more of a brilliant plan than just a move. And it's Karpov's signature to play some seemingly innocuous move with a very deep strategic idea. So the move was rook f to c1. Now, what is the point with rook f to c1? Well, Karpov is going to argue, yes, you have your pawns on dark squares on c5 and a7, and you've blocked my rook along the b-file. However, this is going to have implications for the dynamic potential in black's position because you've blocked the b-file, but what does that mean for your rooks? Your rooks are going to be passive. So Karpov's idea is to prepare the activation of his b-rook and take it to the most effective square in the position from where it can inflict the most damage on black's structure. Remember that the rook is the best equipped piece at taking advantage of pawn weaknesses. So whenever you see your opponent having a backward pawn or an isolated pawn or doubled pawns, your first instinct should be, I need to put a rook on that weakness. So what Carpo is planning is to put the rook on a5 from where it will attack both a7 and c5. Now, should white do this right away, you would run into a little bit of trouble here because of the move bishop to a6, right? So we can't really get away with rook b5 yet. 
So we must prepare this. And the way that we're going to prepare it is by putting our pawn to c4. Now, after rook f to c1, black played the move bishop to b7. Now, this is a bit of a mistake because it doesn't do anything to control the b5 square. Now, the main move, this was actually played many times after this game, and the improvement that a lot of strong grandmasters found was the move bishop to d7, taking b5 under control. Because now, maybe what concerned Kasparov a little bit was the fact that the knight could come to e5, attacking the bishop, and it's not sure what this bishop is going to do, but it can actually go to a4, and the bishop and knight are doing a good job at preventing this rook from reaching its dream square on a5. However, at that time, this was all completely fresh, so Kasparov played the natural move, bishop to b7. And now, after king to f1, bishop d5, we're going to see one of the main points of rook fc1, that now we can simply ignore the threat on the a2 pawn and play rook to b5. Because after bishop takes a2, c4, the bishop is trapped, and there's no way to save it. So white decides to defend the a2 pawn indirectly, actively, and the rook will finally get to a5. So after knight d7, rook to a5, rook f to b8, now pawn to c4, and after bishop to c6, Karpov must decide how to redeploy his minor pieces because they look okay on e2 and f3, but they're actually not doing anything. So here white played the move knight to e1. Now what is the idea of knight to e1? Where are white's minor pieces going? Right? Where would our minor pieces allow our position to reach its full potential? Well, one idea would be to play knight d2 and put the knight on b3, kind of like how black had put his knight on b6. Since we've already activated our rook, we wouldn't be blocking our own rook on b1. But the problem with this move is that it allows black to play the very active rook b2, and we can't really move our knight where we would like to move it because of the tactic bishop takes g2. So rook b2 is a threat, and knight e1 is going to argue that actually I don't want my knight on b3. What I want is my bishop on b3. That's going to shut down the b-file and defend both of my weaknesses. And the knight will come to d3 where it can increase the pressure on c5. Now, of course, the question is, after rook b2, what are we going to do? Because, again, we can't go knight d3 because of bishop takes g2. So, first, we must prepare knight d3 with pawn to f3, dominating the bishop on c6, and preparing knight d3. So now the rook has made it to b2, but it's not going to stay there for very long, because now the knight coming to d3 and the king coming to e1 will effectively control all the squares along the second rank. So Kasparov didn't play rook b2, instead he played rook b4, and now after bishop d1, White continues with his plan, rook b7, pawn to f3, and after rook d8, knight d3, pawn to g5. And the question is, what's going on with this pawn on c5? Can't we just take this? And this is a very nice prophylactic question, right? After knight takes, knight takes, rook takes, it would seem like white is just winning a pawn. But here, what would be in for a very nasty surprise after rook b2, rook takes c6, rook d to d2, and we see the power of the rooks on the seventh rank, black gets enough counterplay to save the game. We have not only the potential for a perpetual check, but also some mating idea. So I don't think that white's going to be able to escape the draw here. So let's go back and see what happened in the game. The pawn on c5 is really low-hanging fruit, so we don't need to rush in terms of capturing it. So Karpov first completed his plan. Bishop b3, completely neutralizing 
Black's counterplay along the B file and thus along the seventh rank. And now there's just no way to stop the move knight takes c5. So now white is clearly better. The game continued king to f8. And after knight takes c5, knight takes c5, rook takes c5. White went on to win this endgame quite convincingly. We won't go through the rest of the game. I don't think that there was really that much to reproach Karpovan and really not too many opportunities for Kasparov to get back into the game. But this was the basic idea, right? Putting the bishop on b3 might seem counterintuitive because you are pretty much killing your own bishop. Now, remember the name of the lecture was the good thing about the bad bishop. So we're not really arguing that this bishop is good in any way. We're arguing that it's allowing the rest of our pieces to become good at the expense of that bishop. So this is kind of the new idea that I took away from this game and the one that I'm going to show next, right? You can sacrifice the quality of one of your pieces, in this case, your bishop, in order to allow your other pieces to become active and to create serious threats. So eventually the game continued and white started pushing the C pawn and the bishop on B3 was actually very good. But like I said, the rest of the game can be found in the attached PGN file. So let's move on to example number two. Okay, so this game is also taken from a world championship match game. This is, I believe, game five between Carlsen and Anand from their 2013 world championship match. So in this position, Carlsen played the move pawn to c5. Now, we're in an endgame, and black has the bishop pair, so that's definitely good news for black. However, there is a very serious downside to black's position, and that is that if black plays something like bishop to c7, white will simply go knight d6 and then continue by doubling rooks on the d-file with tremendous pressure, and this knight on d6 will, at the very least, end up costing black one of his bishops, and probably the game. So white would be clearly better here. So understandably, Anand embraced complications and played pawn to f5. Now, if we put a knight on d6, we're simply hanging our, our c5 pawn. So Carlsen is forced to take on b6, and after f takes e4, another interesting moment arises, analogous to the Karpov-Kasparov game, right? If we go bishop takes e4, after a takes b6, black has really made some major progress here in terms of his pawn structure. Should white try to double up on the d-file, black is going to start putting pawns on dark squares and activating his bishop that didn't look so hot a move ago, now looks very decent. So black has nothing to worry about in this position. So Carlsen played this very strong in-between move, pawn to b7, analogous to Karpov's c6, where now after rook b8, bishop takes e4, rook takes b7, black is going to be left with a broken pawn structure on the queen side. So the game continued rook h to f1, and after rook b5, rook f4, g5, rook f3. Carlsen realizes that there's really not much going on on the d-file because, again, black's idea on the d-file is just to play something like e5 and bishop e6. So instead, he starts to poke around the king side. So black plays h5, and after rook d to f1, bishop to e8, bishop to c2, and rook c5. So here is where the game starts to get very interesting. White has to deal with this annoying pin along the c-file and with the potential threat of bishop to g6. Now, the normal response to this would be to move the king, something maybe like king to b1. But the problem with king to b1 is twofold. There's a strategic problem and a tactical problem. The strategic problem is that we're in an endgame and we want our king to participate in the position. We want to bring our king closer to the center. And here we're just driving it farther away. And the tactical problem is that after rook to e5, we're going to have problems defending our e3 pawn. 
So what happens if we simply try to unpin our bishop by moving the king to d2? Well, this is much better. Unfortunately, after rook d5, we're going to have a hard time escaping these checks because if we go something like king to e2, well, now we need to be careful that this bishop doesn't start doing some serious damage to our own position when it comes to h5. And if we go to c3, then rook c5 is a problem. We would have to go king b3. That looks like an uncomfortable square for the king. Maybe black will just go rook e5 and put pressure on this pawn anyway. And finally, if king to c1, the position simply gets repeated. So Carlson found a very elegant solution to this problem. He said, okay, I don't really know where I'm going to put my king yet. I definitely don't want to put it on b1. I would like to put it on d2, but I can't. But right away, I have to deal with bishop g6. So just rook f6, stopping the bishop from coming to g6. And now after pawn to h4, we want to play king d2 really, really badly. But again, it runs into rook d5. So again, Carlson just says, okay, if rook d5 is a problem, I'll play pawn to e4. And now I'm ready to play king d2. So black played a5, and sure enough, king d2 was played. And after rook b5, b3, we start to see a similar pattern emerge from the karpov kasparov game. We see that this bishop on c2, with every passing move, is starting to look worse and worse. And this is absolutely true. This is not a particularly good-looking bishop. But what it allows white to do is the freedom to activate his rooks and, most importantly, to activate his king, right? So this king, instead of being tucked away on b1, is now going to be an active participant in the game. So the game followed bishop h5, king c3, rook c5, king b2. Also, this rook on c5 is starting to look dangerously pseudo dominated especially by this pawn on e4 and now after rook d8 rook 1 to f2 and rook d4 so it looks like black is getting very active that black has done some major progress right that bishop that looks so poor on d7 is now not being interfered with by its own pawns but getting the pawns to dark squares came at a price and a high price and that was the overextension of the king side pawns. And this is exactly what white is going to start putting pressure on. In the game, Carlson played rook to h6. And now black doesn't really have much of a choice but to play bishop d1. And it seems counterintuitive that black would want to trade off his bishop, which looks like a good bishop, for white's bad looking bishop. But again, this bishop is so important because it protects white's weaknesses, particularly the e4 pawn. So after bishop d1, bishop b1, white refuses the trade. And after rook b5, it seems like white's in a little bit of trouble because b3 is hanging and we can't go bishop a2, not only because it looks disgusting, but also because it hangs the e4 pawn. But of course, Carlson had foreseen this with the move king c3, the active defense once again kind of like that rook b5 move that Karpo played ignoring the threat on the a2 pawn. So another black pawn goes to a dark square, pawn to c5, and white simply defends the b3 pawn. Now pawn to e5, all the black pawns are on dark squares. This should be fantastic news for black, but actually they are too far advanced, and the black rooks are poorly coordinated. So Black's position is actually very fragile. The game continued rook g6, and here we start to encounter the first serious tactical problems for black. Black has to start answering the question of how am I going to defend these pawns? So black played a4, and now after rook takes g5, rook takes b3, rook takes, bishop takes, rook takes e5, king to d6, and now rook to h5. So white has won a pawn, but things are not entirely over for black. And this game is going to take a very interesting spin. After rook d1, pawn to e5, king d5, black is very active, so black should not give up hope here. Bishop h7, rook c1, king b2, rook g1, 
And now after bishop g8, king c6, rook h6, king d7, bishop takes b3, a takes b3, king takes b3, rook takes g2, and rook takes h4. Okay, I've gone through the past few moves fairly quickly because I wanted to reach this position. This is a fascinating endgame where black can actually save the game. This is a drawn position, but black must find the right idea and must play a very important move right now. So in the game, a non played king to e6, which is actually a losing move. And let's see how he lost, and then we'll come back and try to see with that information what black could have played. So the problem with king e6, and one of the things that I like to do when I study endgames is I like to assign a very specific job to each one of my pieces, right? In endgames, we don't have a lot of pieces, so this should be only like maybe two, three pieces tops that we need to assign jobs to. In this case, the king's job should be to stop the a pawn. So this king needs to get to either a6, a7, or a8, somewhere where it's gonna keep the a pawn under control. And the rook's job is going to be to stop the h pawn and to keep this e5 pawn under control. And ideally we would want to just trade off c5 for e5, and then our king will control the a pawn and our rook will control the h pawn. So the problem with king e6 is that now the king and the rook are gonna be stepping on each other's toes, right? They are both gonna be doing the same job and nobody's gonna be guarding the a pawn. And sure enough, this is what happened. After a4, king takes e5, a5, king d6, here, Anand must have missed this killer move, rook to h7, and now the king is cut off. So the pawn will reach a7, and the king will not be able to control the a8 square. So sure enough, after king d5, a6, c4, king c3, rook a2, a7, king c5, and now after h4, Anand simply resigned. There's nothing that he can do to meet the advance of the h pawn, rook g7, and then the further advance of the h pawn. So black resigned. Now let's go back to that position before king to e6, because now that we know where the king should go, all that remains is to ask ourselves where the rook should go. So what should black play here? Well, the correct move is rook to e2. Because again, the key idea here, aside from guarding the A pawn with our king, is to trade off the C and E pawns. If we manage to do that, the end game where white has a, the two outside passers is going to be a theoretical draw. This is known as Vancouver's position, or the, there are many different uh, variants on Vancouver's position. For example, let's say after pawn to A4, there's actually no good way of defending E5 which is why rook e2 is so strong. If we were to play rook h5, as white, we would get a very passive position and we wouldn't be able to make too much progress, right? After rook e3, if we lose the a pawn, that's an easy draw for black. So for example, king a4, king c6, rook h6, king d5, your king is paralyzed, I'm about to push my c pawn, it's at least gonna cost you one or two of your pawns. For example, after e6, c4, Let's say h4, c3, king b3, c2, king takes c2, rook takes a3. Black will easily stop these two pawns because his rook and king are so much more active than their white counterparts. So let's say white decides to cut his losses, say, you know what? That e pawn is really not worth my time. I would rather just get active and start pushing my outside passers, right? So a4, rook takes e5. King c4, king c6, rook h6, and after king b7, a5. This is the key position, right? So our idea was to trade our c pawn for white's e pawn. We already won the e pawn, so we shouldn't get greedy here and say, oh, but now I'm going to keep my c pawn too, right? We don't care about that pawn. That pawn can actually become more of an interference than anything else. So after rook e4, we are happy to part with the c5 pawn. And after king takes c5, 
this is the key of Vancouver's position, right? Normally, these types of endgames would be winning for White. If White can just get this rook not being in front of its own pawn, this is going to be an easy win for White. So, for example, if we got the rook to g2 or if we, you know, got the rook to h1, this would be game over. But Black has a small window of opportunity here to take advantage of this misplaced rook on h6. So the key is the a pawn is never a problem. The king's got it under control. He's got these three squares. We can forget about it. What we need to do is keep the pressure on h2 so that this rook will always have to go back and forth along the h file. So the key move is rook e2, and we're always going to stay on that h pawn. If the h pawn moves forward, our rook will move up along the e file with it. So for example, let's say if king b5 may be creating some threats on our king, we can always take the time to give a check and let's say give some more checks. And as soon as this king starts to get close to our rook, our rook will go right back and put its attention on the h pawn. And if the h pawn moves forward, our rook will follow it along. So now, for example, if king d5, our rook will have to stay on the h pawn. Once again, rook g4, for example. If h5, just rook g5, check. So let's say king e5, king a7. And now after this king gets close to our rook, we need to move our rook away so that it will keep the pressure on h4, but also the moment that the king defends the h pawn, relieving the rook and allowing it to move away, that's when the rook starts to give checks, right? So the rook defends along the rank, not the file. So for example, after rook c4, king g5, rook c5, there's just no nowhere for this king to hide. It can't really go anywhere to escape the checks. It's always going to get checked along the rank. So instead of, let's say, king g5, white could try to give a check and keep advancing the pawn. But again, as soon as that pawn advances, our rook gives checks. And if for king g6, well, here it would be a decisive mistake to get greedy, right? If we take this pawn, it allows the white rook to leave and it clears the way for the h pawn. So now white is completely winning. So of course, the correct move is check. And after king g7, rook c7, again, there's just no way of escaping the checks. And it's a beautiful example of a well-played endgame. What does a well-played endgame mean? It means an endgame where you assigned the correct jobs for each one of your pieces and those pieces did their jobs perfectly, right? So the king, it seems like it didn't do anything, but actually did a lot because it allowed us not to worry about this a pawn and it allowed us to focus all of our attention on preventing this white rook from ever getting active. So anyway, I thought this was a nice selection of games that illustrates a, a novel strategic idea or a new way of looking at an old strategic idea, right? This, this bad bishop that's actually not so bad and also a fascinating endgame. A tough endgame because it happened in a world championship match game and the world champion was not able to, to find the right method. So I hope you enjoy these games. This has been Grandmaster Robert Hungaski for ChessLecture.com.